Hey there, AP Environmental Science class. All right, welcome back to part two of my lecture on chapter nine, sustaining biodiversity and saving species and uh, ecological services. So uh, we were uh, left off uh, in part one talking about invasive species, uh, these species that are not native to an area that either come in accidentally or maybe purposefully uh, by, by humans. And then because they don't have any natural predators or, or any natural checks and balances, uh, a lot of times these invasive species can 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 basically uh, run wild uh, and basically end up destroying biodiversity uh, and potentially destroying uh, food webs and things like that. So uh, we'll, we'll start off uh, part two of this lecture. How do we control invasive species? Well, uh, research programs are used to identify who the invaders are. Uh, we then track the invasive species with ground surveys and satellite observations. So again, this uh, now, as we're into the 21st century, we can actually uh, do this uh, quickly uh, and very reliably. Uh, we establish international treaties banning the transfer uh, of these uh, invasive species between countries. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, treaties and some laws uh, in just a couple of slides. And public education about releasing exotic pets and plants can also help. Again, we spoke about in the previous lesson how uh, in Florida, for instance, people would get these boa constrictors for pets, realize uh, they don't want a snake that big in their house, uh, and then let the snake go in the Everglades. Uh, and obviously that uh, destroys uh, the uh, the webs, the food webs there, and the biodiversity by putting this invasive species in. So again, just public education uh, about how you shouldn't be releasing exotic pets and plants uh, into the environment uh, can definitely help. Uh, what can you do to control invasive species? Well, here are just some uh, things that you can do. Do not buy wild plants or animals or remove them from natural areas. Uh, do not release wild pets in natural areas. Do not dump aquarium contents or unused fishing bait. Uh, when camping, only use local firewood. Um, and uh, again, brush or clean pet dogs, hiking boots, um, uh, mountain bikes, et cetera, before leaving a, a wild area because you know, something may be on your boot. Let's say you go hiking. Uh, let's say you drive five hours upstate, go hiking, and then come back to Ardsley. Well, there might be something, a uh, bacteria, some kind of moss or a lichen or something, who knows, stuck on your foot, on your on your shoe, that then you could transport back, uh, back here uh, to Ardsley at and potentially uh, 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 introduce an invasive species. So again, uh, these are just some ways uh, that we can uh, potentially control uh, those invasive species. All right, population growth, high rates of resource use, pollution and climate change, uh, human population growth and rising resource use per person, obviously degrading the wildlife habitat. All right, nothing new here. We've talked about this. Pollution, a couple of terms. Bioaccumulation occurs in individual organisms. Biomagnification occurs when a chemical becomes more concentrated as it moves up through food chains and food webs. So what does that mean? Bioaccumulation is just the accumulation of pollution in your body. So let's say mercury, all right? Uh, many of you have heard that uh, salmon uh, contains high levels of mercury. So if you eat salmon, uh, you are accumulating, bioaccumulating uh, that mercury in your system. Biomagnification occurs when, okay, let's say we have this salmon that has mercury in it, and let's say uh, a bird of prey, for instance, uh, comes down and eats that salmon. Or let's say a bear, right? Okay, a bear uh, eats that salmon as it's right swimming up the stream, goes in, eats the salmon, okay? Then we, as a human, maybe kill that bear and eat that bear, okay? What happens is biomagnification occurs when the chemical becomes more concentrated as it moves up the food chain. So that mercury that was in the initial salmon then gets magnified or biomagnified that pollution when that that salmon is eaten by the bear so then when we eat the bear again that magnification that biomagnification increases okay and we actually get more of a concentration of that mercury by eating the bear than we would have if we just ate the salmon first Okay, so again, this is just a rudimentary example, but that's what biomagnification is. As you go through the food chain, the pollution gets more concentrated. So by the time you get to the top of the food chain, uh, whatever is your uh, tertiary consumers are, are, are eating a high concentration of that pollution, that initial pollution. And again, that is called biomagnification. 
Climate change, we're thinking, is accelerating the sixth extinction. Again, we talked about that in the previous lesson, that sixth extinct extinction, mass extinction, most likely happening right now, caused by us humans. Uh, and again, this is a major loss of diversity and ecosystem services. So uh, just again, this is a diagram that shows that biomagnification. Again, a DDT is what we're talking about here. A DDT in water, uh, about three parts per trillion, right? Then in zooplankton, okay, which kind of lives in the water, it's a little higher, right? Four, four parts per trillion or, or parts, parts per 0 0.04 parts, parts per million, right? Uh, then as we get into small fish, which eat the zooplankton, we find that DDT has increased uh, to 0.5 parts per million. And then uh, needlefish, which eat the small minnows, we find that the DDT is two parts per million in them. And then the offspray, which eat the needlefish, well, by then, the DDT is 25 parts per million. So you can see going from 0 0.000003 parts per million to 25 parts per million of this pollution, this DDT. But again, this could be any, any pollution, okay? And that's what biomagnification is all about. As you go up through the food chain, as you go up through trophic levels, the pollution magnifies so that the osprey is getting most of the pollution as compared to, let's say, the uh, zooplankton down at the bottom of the food chain. Again, that is biomagnification. Bioaccumulation is just what each individual organism, uh, the pollution is accumulating. But the biomagnification is as you go up into the trophic levels, the pollution gets more and more concentrated. Okay. <clears throat> Illegal killing, capturing, and selling of wild species. This is obviously another issue uh, when we have to, uh, to think about sustaining biodiversity. All right, poaching and smuggling of protected animals. Believe it or not, folks, it's the 21st century. This is still a huge issue, especially in other parts of the world like Africa and like Asia. Organized crime involved because of the huge profits that are involved. Elephants and rhinos are killed for their tusks and their horns still. Tigers are poached for their skin and other body parts. In addition, the pet trade is a huge economic, uh, ec economic trade, right? There's a lot of money here. Exotic birds, amphibians, reptiles, tropical fish. So all of this, okay, the illegal killing, capturing, and selling of wild species obviously decreases our biodiversity and uh, can unfortunately cause some species to become extinct. Uh, this is not a pretty picture here. So if you're faint of heart, I would uh, may want to close your eyes. But obviously, this is a rhinoceros uh, that has been uh, killed just for its horns. And this is the horrible part because, again, back 300 years ago, four or 500 years ago, what would humans do? They would kill this rhino, but they would eat it. They would use its skin to survive, to maybe make clothing. They would, they would use all the animals' resources for themselves. Nowadays, look at what humans are doing. They're just killing the rhino, cutting off its, its horns, and, and not even using the rest of it. Okay, this is not what we need, obviously. Okay, this is illegal, totally illegal. Okay, and it's also, in my opinion, immoral. Because again, if you're going to kill an animal, use the entire animal, please. Okay, don't just use a part of it and then discard the rest. Uh, like this animal means nothing. Okay, this animal had a life as well, just like you and I have a life. All right, uh, here's a case study disturbing message from birds. 70% of the birds, uh, world's bird species are declining. One of eight bird species are threatened with extinction, mostly in tropical forests, those tropical rainforests that, again, we say are, are these vast islands of biodiversity, uh, but they are being uh, uh, torn down for agriculture, for building uh, homes and things like that. Uh, so, again, one of eight bird species threatened with extinction, and many of them in these tropical forests. One of the causes, I just talked about it, habitat loss and degradation, okay, migrating birds. Birds have an issue with that, obviously invasive species, uh, and obviously climate change having a big issue as well. Uh, exposure to pesticides, another big issue that uh, we're seeing bird populations decline. And again, over-exploitation. So a lot of that hip, HIPCO, right, that we talked about in the previous 
uh, previous lesson, that, that HIPCO, uh, basically the same uh, issues here, uh, dealing uh, disturbing or at least uh, uh, disturbing the bird populations over exploitation. All right, parrots are threatened due to sale as pets. Again, illegal. Uh, birds are indicator species, so they respond quickly to environmental change. So very sim similar to like frogs, right? Birds are those indicator species. We see them starting to decline rapidly, and that's basically an alarm uh, that we are degrading our environment too quickly. Uh, birds perform critical ecosystem and economic services, so without them, extinctions could affect many other species, okay, as birds are critical uh, when we talk about uh, ecosystem and e economic services. Rising demand for bushmeat threatens some African species. So this is now, uh, again, just more issues that we have with trying to uh, sustain species, sustain biodiversity, uh, and, and to stop species from becoming extinct. But bushmeat is a source of food in West and Central Africa. Hunting wildlife has skyrocketed within the past three decades. All right, one species of red uh, Columbus monkey actually has become extinct. Uh, and we've reduced the population, like we talked about before, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, elephants, and hippos. Uh, USAID introducing methods, all right, USAID introducing methods for breeding alternative sources of protein to villagers. So what this, uh, this uh, USAID is trying to do is trying to show these villagers in these African countries uh, that they can find other sources of protein rather than killing these endangered uh, endangered species and these endangered animals. Okay, so again, uh, this is a, more of that public education uh, that we are trying to use uh, to help uh, uh, eliminate uh, these species uh, becoming extinct. Again, not a pretty picture here, okay? Uh, if you are uh, you know don't like to see this, close your eyes, but obviously that's a, a, some sort of monkey that is uh, that was beheaded, obviously, uh, so that its meat uh, can be used and can be eaten. And the point is here, you know, it's okay if you're going to eat the meat, but unfortunately these creatures are endangered. So we have to stop killing them right now, let their numbers uh, re re repopulate, okay? And so we have to teach these uh, these African villagers that you can find your protein, you can get your nutrients uh, in, in other ways, and that's what we are trying to help them with. So how can we sustain wild species and the ecosystem services they provide? Well, ways to reduce species extinction and sustain ecosystem services. Establishing and enforcing national environmental laws and international treaties and creating protected wildlife sanctuaries or places for these species to live undisturbed. Okay, so those are things that we need to do. So here are some treaties and laws. Now look, unfortunately, you are going to have to put these treaties and laws to memory. All right, you are going to have to know these. All right, so 1975, Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, called CITES, C-I-T-E-S, Convention. International Trade Endangered Species, okay? Signed by 181 countries, all right? And this basically uh, basically prohibits, all right, trading in these endangered species, all right, from countries to country. And again, signed by uh, 181 countries. We have the Convention on Biological Diversity, the BCD, all right, commits governments to reduce the rate of biodiversity loss. It was ratified in 196 countries, unfortunately not by us, uh, but this law lacks an enforcement mechanism. So uh, DCD, all right, not uh, as, as uh, powerful as it could be. Uh, and of course, when the U.S., which is, um, you know, hey, look, we're the, one of the most powerful countries in the world. We're looked at around the world when we don't ratify these treaties um, or, or these, or these uh, conventions. Other countries take a look, and, and, and unfortunately, many of them uh, follow our lead. Uh, the Endangered Species Act of 1973, an amended several times since then called the ESA, again, Endangered Species Act. It identifies and protects endangered species in the U.S. and abroad, creates a recovery program for listed species. Uh, National Marine Fishery Service uh, was created and, and for ocean species to help with that. Uh, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was created or is used for all other types of species. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, look at everything other than ocean species, while the National Marine Fisheries Services deals with the ocean species. And again, one act, another one that helps us 
all right, is the Endangered Species Act of 1973. It also forbids federal agencies except the defense from funding projects that jeopardize endangered or threatened species. It also requires commercial shipments of wildlife that come through only certain ports so that we can keep an eye on what, uh, what kind of wildlife we're bringing in uh, to our country uh, or into other countries as well. Uh, in 2015, uh, just under 1,600 species are officially listed. All right, and 90% of the ESA protected species are recovering at a projected rate. So this is a win, okay? This is a positive, okay? The Endangered Species Act, all right, has helped, all right? It, 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 it is definitely working as 90% of the ESA protected species are recovering at the rates that we have projected. So again, this is a good story when it comes to saving species and saving biodiversity, the ESA or the uh, Endangered Species Act. Okay, environmental policy, how is it made? Well, it begins when citizens, interest groups, or corporations seek solutions to issues. Uh, a policy life cycle, first you identify a problem, then you research the underlying science to that problem, then you craft a policy solution, you monitor how well it works, and you adjust the policy as needed, like the Endangered Species Act of 1973. It was amended several times because as we monitored how well it worked, we realized that we needed to tweak parts of it, and as a result, it was adjusted, okay? So this is how uh, these policies, these laws, these conventions, at least these are the steps that should be taken, okay, should be taken uh, to have them uh, be the most effective, all right? Identify your problem, research it, craft a solution, monitor how well that solution works, and then adjust the policy as needed as things evolve, okay? As not only creatures evolve, but as uh, the policy itself uh, evolves over time. In addition, talked about establishing wildlife refuge and other sanctuaries of protected areas. This is yet another way that we can help save species. Uh, in 1903, Teddy Roosevelt established the first federal wildlife refuge on Pelican Island in Florida. Uh, since then, we have a lot of these refuges, uh, wildlife refuges. Most are wetland sanctuaries. They provide habitats for 25% of U.S. threatened or endangered species. Harmful activities such as mining, drilling, and using off-road vehicles are legal, believe it or not, in most of these uh, are most of these refuge. Uh, so something to think about, okay? Um, why they're allowing that? Well, unfortunately, a lot of things with politics, it's kind of a uh, give and take, right? We want to create a, a refuge, uh, but some people feel, hey, you're going to create this refuge, but we can't use it. Okay, we're going to create it, but then humans can use it if you want to mine, drill, or use off-road vehicles there. So this is kind of where we, you know, this is where the compromise comes in. Okay, I know we don't use that word compromise a lot in politics anymore, but back in the day, there actually used to be compromise. Uh, politicians actually used to co come to the center and compromise on things. Uh, so again, this is one of those uh, one of those compromises where we have these wildlife refuges, uh, but again, mm, still some harmful activities are allowed. Uh, and again, here is your Pelican Island, which was the first one established by Teddy Roosevelt uh, way back way back in 1903. In addition, seed banks, botanical gardens, and wildlife farms can help us sustain our biodiversity. Seed banks preserve genetic material of endangered plants. There's actually a vault up uh, in the Arctic somewhere that actually has all these seeds okay, of all these plants and flowers throughout the world, and they're, and they're up there. Uh, I believe it's, uh, most of it's underground in the Arctic, and they're basically holding the seeds there, almost like a Noah's Ark. Uh, of, of seeds up there in the Arctic so that if, God forbid, something happens uh, on the planet, uh, we can go up there and retrieve these seeds and still have these this biodiversity. All right, uh, botanical gardens uh, and, and uh, arboretas, all right, which happen to be with trees, okay, uh, living plants, uh, and farms can raise organisms for uh, commercial sale as well, okay, on these wildlife farms, uh, again, which can help. Uh, zoos and aquariums also can help sustain biodiversity. Now, there are is some questions, are, you know, some people talk about zoos uh, not being so good for animals, uh, but in, in many cases, uh, they have techniques that help preserve endangered terrestrial species like egg pulling, captive breeding, artificial insemination, embryo transfer, use of incubators, 
uh, and cross fostering, just helping uh, creatures that maybe have a low re re reproductive rate, right? If you only pr uh, produce one offspring and it dies, uh, you're in trouble. So uh, for some of these uh, low, you know, these K specialists, right, who have uh, who have these 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 low birth rates, these these low reproductive rates, by helping them reproduce and making sure if they do uh, reproduce that the that the uh, that the little the little one makes it uh, to 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 reproductive maturity. Okay, very important and a good technique uh, to help preserve creatures. Ultimate goal of captive breeding programs is to eventually release or reintroduce populations to the wild. So it's not to keep these creatures in zoos and aquariums forever. Uh, the, the ultimate goal of this captive breeding program is to eventually reintroduce uh, those creatures out into the wild. Uh, captive populations must number 100 to 500 individuals for that to begin to happen. Public aquariums also provide education. All right? Not effective gene banks used due to limited funds uh, but they do provide education. And again, here is just a, a picture of an aquarium uh, for you. All right, uh, the precautionary principle is used when we talk about sustaining species and biodiversity. What's the precautionary principle? Act to prevent or, prevent or reduce harm when preliminary evidence indicates acting is needed. Good strategy in other areas, preventing exposure to harmful chemicals in our air, water, and food. Basically, what it's saying is don't wait for the fire to happen and then put the fire out. But basically, the precautionary principle is saying if you see some smoke, most likely there's fire, put it out. Okay? Uh, don't wait until your house is completely engulfed in flame. That's what the precautionary principle is saying. Act to prevent or reduce harm when preliminary evidence indicates acting is needed. So we see some indication like, like what? Like bird species declining, like frog species, amphibian species declining. We see that. We don't wait until they're all gone. Okay? The precautionary principle says you start seeing them decline, you better act now. Okay? Before there is before they become extinct okay so again i use the the fire you see a little smoke put it put out the flame don't wait until your house uh, is completely engulfed in fire emphasis on preventing species extinction again what i just said act early rather than when a species is nearly extinct all right, protecting species and ecosystem services, they raise difficult questions. Should we focus on protecting species or ecosystem and services they provide? So what do we do? Do we protect just the species or do we protect their ecosystems? All right, what should we be concentrating on? Should we be concentrating on protecting that one bird or should we be concentrate on protecting the ecosystem the bird lives in and then uh, the, the thinking is if you protect the ecosystem, then the bird populations will begin to increase. So again, what do we look at first? How do we decide which species get attention, right? Protecting species appealing to humans can increase public awareness of the need. So something like, uh, so something like, uh, you know, like, like, like an elephant, okay, which we love, and they, we say they're intelligent, and they, you know, we, we when they're when they're when they're when they part of them die, we see that the whole herd, okay, so they're they're appealing to humans, elephants, so that can increase public awareness. But what about some other creature, like a little insect that we don't really like, that is coming that is becoming extinct? You know, how do we choose? Uh, how do we determine which habitat areas to protect? How do we allocate resources? So these are questions, uh, then these are the ethical and moral questions that, that come out of this discussion. And unfortunately, there may not be any, any right or wrong answers here, okay? Um, and these are, again, these are the, uh, the, uh, the moral and the ethical things that we talk about when we talk about environmental science. So what can you do to protect species? Do not buy furs, ivory products, or other items made from endangered or threatened animal species. Do not not buy wood or wood products from tropical or old growth forests. Do not buy pet animals or plants taken from the wild and tell friends and relatives what you're doing about this problem. Again, education, that's what it's all about. All right, guys, so this is the uh, final slide of this lesson on chapter nine. Hope you enjoyed, and as always, thanks for listening.